What -o, and welcome to The War Report, an online informative history channel focused on the Second World War. In this episode, we'll be exploring the untold story of Arnhem and Operation Market Garden. We hope you enjoy the episode. Tally ho! About two hours ago, Supreme Headquarters gave the news of our airborne landing in Holland in this brief announcement. Strong forces of the 1st Allied Airborne Army were landed in Holland this afternoon. Operation Market Garden was launched in September 1944. The plan was to seize key bridges in the Netherlands by members of the American 181st and 82nd Airborne and the British 1st Airborne Division, landing by parachute and glider. A British armoured spearhead known as 30 Corps would then rush up the route linking up the airborne and forcing a path into the Ruhr. However, within a matter of days, it was clear that Operation Market Garden had failed, and thousands of British troops were left trapped on the north side of the Rhine River in Arnhem. This is the story of Operation Berlin, the plan to rescue them. With the D-Day invasion, of the 6th of June 1944. The Allies quickly secured a beachhead and a firm grip along the Normandy front. However, advancing inland proved difficult. Normandy's thick hedgerows, some of which were 1,000 years old, were a defender's heaven. Look, Jerry's over there, chaps! Easily disguising machine gun nests and ambushes. English assault Fire! The fighting in an aerial called Falaise in August 1944 proved decisive. The Allies encircled the German Army Group B, 7th Army, and 5th Panzer Army trapping them. This, combined with heavy RAF air attacks due to Allied air superiority, led the Germans inside what would become to be known as the Falaise Pocket or Gap to be eliminated. The Battle of Normandy had been won. Following this, the Allies enjoyed three weeks of rapid advance, in which they covered over 250 miles of ground, the fastest advance in military history. Paris was liberated, then Brussels. Next, the industrial German heartland of the Ruhr was in the Allies' sights. However, a vast array of waterways and bridges were in the way. Now, if it were possible to capture these bridges and secure these waterways, the Allies could create a path directly into the Ruhr and on to Berlin and end the war by Christmas. The answer? A combined airborne and ground forces operation creating a corridor to force a path into the Ruhr. On the 17th of September 1944, Operation Market Garden the brainchild of British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery was launched. The plan was as follows. The Allies were to seize eight road bridges to create a 64 mile long salient, bypassing the heavily defended German secret line, forcing a route directly into the Ruhr, the German industrial heartland. Operation Market Garden was made up of two sub-operations. The first, Market. Airborne soldiers of the combined 1st Allied Airborne Army were to drop behind enemy lines and secure the bridges. The second, Garden. The armoured spearhead of the British 30 Corps would move forward, linking up with the airborne, securing the bridges and creating the corridor. This plan was indeed daring, and it would need to be successful within one week, so the Germans could not reorganise. There were eight bridges, eight waterways between the Allied front line and Germany. Each one would need to be taken and held intact if Operation Market Garden were to come to fruition. Launching the biggest airborne operation in history was indeed a humongous feat, even with British ingenuity at the forefront. 30,000 men of the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions and the 1st British Airborne Division were to land behind enemy lines and attempt to capture the bridges. Tanks of 30 Corps under the command of Lieutenant General Horrocks would then move forward over the bridges through Eindhoven and Nijmegen and onto the Rhine at Arnhem, linking up with the airborne along the way. The airborne corridor 
was 30 miles long, and at the end of it was the British first ever division at Arnhem on the yeah. lower Rhine. If all went to plan, once over the Rhine, the Allies could bear down on the Ruhr, where much of the German war machine was manufactured, and God willing, drive towards Berlin. By holding the bridge at Arnhem, the Allied forces could turn and push into the Ruhr Valley. Of the Brits who landed in Arnhem, around 40% of them were from the Parachute Regiment, later supported by Polish paratroopers, from the 1st Independent Polish Parachute Brigade, under the command of Lieutenant General Sasabalski. The remainder of the troops were comprised of regiments landed by the Glider Pilot Regiment. 30 Corps expected to relieve them within two days of them landing and capturing the bridge. The British parachute landings began on the 17th of September and were carried out over three days. There was one major problem for the Tommies. German resistance in the area was much higher than anticipated. Unfortunately for them, two SS Panzer divisions had been moved into the Arnhem area to refit after the fighting in the Normandy campaign. Consequently, only a small force under the command of Colonel John Frost were able to reach the bridge, capturing one end, even though they found themselves outnumbered and undergunned. However, the plucky Brits were not about to lay down arms without a fight, and this fighting spirit is highlighted by this following account. On the morning of Tuesday the 19th of September, 25-year-old engineer Lance Sergeant Stan Halliwell was delivering much needed ammunition to a position held by fellow 1st Parrot members when he was captured by a German patrol. Crossing the bridge, Halliwell was fired upon by the Brits, who mistook him to be a German. This forced Halliwell to run from building to building in what he described as the worst 10 minutes of his life. The Brits, however, soon realised he was in fact a Tommy. When reaching Frost's HQ, Halliwell informed the Colonel of the German proposal. Colonel John Frost's response was blunt and to the point. Tell him to go to hell! Halliwell was informed by Frost that returning to the German lines or not was entirely his decision. Now, not being too keen on this idea, Halliwell decided to stay with the Brits and fight, reasoning that the Germans would probably guess this before long. This scene, although changed for cinematic effect, was emulated in the 1977 film, A Bridge Too Far. He is willing to discuss a surrender. Tell him to go to hell. We haven't the proper facilities to take you all prisoner. Sorry. The remainder of the 1st British Airborne Division established a defensive perimeter around the Hartmannstein Hotel in used to be an Arnhem suburb. The British forces hoped that when 30 Corps finally reached them and made the river crossing, they would be able to establish a bridge. On Thursday, the 21st of September, Polish paratroops, or the 1st Independent Polish Parachute Brigade, left England to provide much needed reinforcement to the Brits in the Arnhem area. Poor weather conditions led the Poles to be ordered back to their bases, as it had become clear that by the time the Poles reached their drop zones on the south side of the Rhine River, weather conditions would be too dangerous. A coded message was sent to the formation of C-47s to return. However, the wrong messages were sent, and as a result, it was left to the pilot's judgement whether to return to base or to press on. Meanwhile, the 2nd Battalion moved up towards the drill to Heverdorf Ferry, which the Poles would rely on to ferry them across the river. However, fury ensued when the ferry was found to be out of action, scuttled by the Germans. Sazobelski erupted with rage. Attempts were made to relieve the 1st Airborne Division. Major General Roy Urquhart, the chap in charge of the Brits and Ireland, originally wanted the Poles to cross the river and take up positions with them on the night of the 21st. Unfortunately, due to the scuttled ferry and lack of boats, the Poles were forced to withdraw into drill for the night. Lead elements of 30 Corps did, however, arrive at the Polish positions in drill the next day. However, the Germans implemented a blocking line to the west, preventing an advance on the bridge. On the night of Friday the 22nd, the Poles once again attempted to cross the Rhine to reach the Brits in a used to be perimeter. Sosobolsky had managed to source boats from 30 Corps, each capable 
of carrying 16 men. Unfortunately, when the boats arrived, it turned out that only five had enough space to carry 12 men each. The Poles wanted to get 600 men over the Rhine that night. Unfortunately, due to strong currents and heavy German machine gun fire, many landed right in the midst of the German positions and were captured. Over the next few days, the situation worsened for aircraft to men on the north side of the Rhine. Due to communication failure, 1st Airborne Divisional HQ were having serious difficulties in conveying the seriousness of their situation. On the night of the 23rd, Urquhart managed to send a message to Lieutenant General Browning's Corps HQ in Nijmegen. No knowledge of Div in Ireland for 24 hours. Balance of Div in very tight perimeter. Heavy mortaring and machine gun fire, followed by local attacks. Main nuisance, SP guns. Our casualties heavy. Resources stretched to the utmost. Relief within 24 hours vital. By now, 30 Corps had arrived in drill and strength. A large-scale crossing was planned for the night of Sunday the 24th. General Sosabowski surveyed the area. He found that although the German strength was considerable, it was concentrated in the vicinity of the besieged Brits in Oosterbeek. Therefore, he suggested an attack comprised of the entire 43rd Wessex Division and his Polish Brigade to be carried out several miles upstream. Once over the Rhine, the plan was to assemble quickly and to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. However, Major General Thomas had a plan of his own. His units of the 4th Battalion Dorsetshire Regiment would cross directly opposite the high ground of the Westerboring restaurant on the southwestern end of the Oosterbeek perimeter, an area firmly under German control. Without Sazobowski's approval, his 1st Battalion of the Polish paratroops were removed from his command and joined up with the Dorsets, also tasked with ferrying much needed supplies. At the same time as this crossing, 2200 hours, the remaining Polish brigade were to cross further upstream of the perimeter. However, lack of boats led to the Polish crossing being cancelled. Priority was given to the Dorsets. Initially, the Dorset crossing went to plan. A and B company crossed with little enemy resistance. This was not to last. Increasing enemy fire led to the rest of the crossing being cancelled. 315 Dorsets had made it to the far bank, but landed in small and scattered groups, close to German positions. Consequently, the Dorsets never really had the chance to properly form up, and thus were easily dealt with by the Germans. Only 75 Dorsets made it to Oosterby, and crucially, none of the supplies made the crossing successfully. Disaster had happened. This was the final nail in the coffin of Operation Market Garden. British commanders now knew that it could no longer succeed. Additionally, two days previous, on the 22nd, a German counterattack in the Eidhoven area had cut the road to Arnhem. British tanks of 30 Corps and members of the American 101st Airborne fought gravely to reopen the route, but this took an extra 48 hours. Montgomery's dream of ending the war by Christmas had been dashed. On Monday the 25th, the besieged Urquhart received a communique from Major General Thomas from the drill side of the river, stating that Urquhart must withdraw his men from Utebi. At 8 a.m., the following radio transmission was received. Operation Berlin must be tonight. What do you mean we're surrounded? Well, fetch the Canadians, they're awfully good chaps, they'll sort it out. Okay? Alright, thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, bye. bye, bye. Please subscribe and support our social media and all that other newfangled governs. We also have a Patreon, so please consider supporting us on there. Tally-ho, pip-pip, and Bernard's your uncle.